In this video, we're going to be setting up our collision system so that something happens when our enemies or these cubes hit our player. So whenever we're deciding to make a collision system, we have to think about whether we want something to happen when things overlap or when things collide. Let's demonstrate the difference. Collision happens at this point where the two objects are touching but are not overlapping. Overlapping happens the moment that one object enters inside the other's mesh. This is known as on overlap start. Overlapping continues as the object moves through the secondary object, and the moment that the object comes out the other side, this would be on overlap end, so the next frame after the two objects separate. With that demonstration done, let's think back to how our enemy is moving. Our enemy is not moving like a physics object through the world. We are simply setting the object's location manually on every frame. Therefore, we do not want to use collision because technically there's no collision that is taking place. So to make things easier on ourselves, we're going to use overlapping for the purposes of our collision system in this game. The basic idea here is since our player is always colliding with the ground, we are going to set the actual collision or overlapping event inside of our enemy itself. And then we're going to have to create a way to handle that collision within our player. So let's open up our enemy's header file. Inside the header file, we are going to create a private on overlap start function that's going to use the exact signature that I'm going to provide. I did talk about how you can find these signatures for yourself in a previous video through the Flappy Bird tutorial, so if you're interested on the method I use to find this stuff, feel free to check in there. Now, this is going to be a U function, and it's going to be a void function that we call on overlap start. Now, this is a pre-built function, and it requires a lot of parameters. Let's go through them one at a time. First, we need a U primitive component. This U primitive component is going to be a pointer and we're gonna call this the overlapped component. Next, we're gonna get a pointer to an actor. And we're gonna call this the other actor. So this is going to be the other actor that's involved in the overlap. Next, we're gonna need another U primitive component. And this is going to be a pointer towards a variable that we're going to call other component. And this would be the specific component on the other actor that is involved in this collision. And then next, some stuff that I don't necessarily know the specific meaning of, we're going to have a variable of type int 32 that we're going to call the other body index. And then we're going to need a Boolean called B from sweep. And then we're going to need a constant F hit result that we're going to call sweep result. So this is the exact function that you're going to need to have for using overlaps inside of Unreal Engine 5. With this created in our header file, I'm now going to hit Alt Enter and create the exact same definition inside of my C++ file. And I will make this on two lines so that everything is visible on screen at the same time. So now inside of enemy.cpp, we are first going to need to set up what is called when this overlap occurs. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to go up into begin play. So now we're going to set up a situation. We need to get a reference to when our box component is involved in an overlapping event. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to call our box component variable. And we're going to call a method off of that called on component begin overlap. Off of this, we're going to hit dot add dynamic. And this is one of the times that you are going to want to ignore the IntelliSense. Inside of add dynamic, we're going to give two variables. First, we're going to say that we want this to occur to this object, and then we're going to give it the method that we want to call. And of course, this is going to be off of a enemy, and we want to call the on overlap start method that we created previously. So now what we're saying here is when our box component begins overlapping with something, we are going to look at the enemy that it happened to and call the method on overlap start, which is this method down here that we're now going to set up. So we really only care about overlap events that occur with our dinosaur character, or our a dino character. And this variable is going to be called dino, and we're going to make it equal to the casted value of a dino character, and we're going to see other actor. So what this line is doing in theory is we are basically saying, is the other actor that's involved in this overlap event able to be a dino character? If it is, we want to store that inside of the variable called dino for future use. Now you'll notice there's a red line here yelling at me. Now you don't have to write an angry comment for this. The reason this is taking place is we haven't included this header file yet. So let's scroll all the way to the top of our file here. And now we're going to go and we are going to include 
our dino character dot h so that we're able to use this file in this object. Once I click away, you will see that it no longer yells at me. Fantastic. Now we're going to create an if statement and we're going to say that if our dino is not equal to a null pointer, then we're going to do something. The reason that we have to put this if statement here is on any circumstance where our enemy is overlapping with, say, the floor or something else that we implement later, we don't want it to do what we're about to do for the dino. So we only care about this happening if our dinosaur is an actual dinosaur or our dino character. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to call our variable dino and we're going to make a method off of this called handle hit. Now, obviously we haven't built this yet, so it's going to yell at us, but that's fine. So now we're gonna go and set up this handle hit method inside of our dino character. So let's open up dino character.h for the header file, and let's create a public method that we're gonna call handle hit. So this is going to be a void method that we're going to call handle hit. And with alt and enter, I'm now going to create the definition of that inside of my C++ file. And now we're ready to get down to business here. When we think about what we want to happen when we get hit by an enemy. We want something to be funny and dramatic. And usually we want to disable the player's ability to make further inputs so they know that they've done bad. To do all of these things, we're going to call methods off of our capsule component because that's what's going to control most of our character's movements. Now remember that every character has a capsule component that comes with them by default that isn't necessarily set up by us. In order for us to use the methods nice and easily from this capsule component, we're going to have to include that header file. So let's scroll up to the top of this and make sure that you have included components slash capsule component dot h. Once you have done so, you're going to be able to call the method called get capsule component. This is going to give you a reference to that capsule component that we have on our character. And we're going to call a method off of this called set simulate physics. Now, what we need to give this is we need to give this a Boolean true or false. And we're going to turn this on. So we're going to pass in true. Now, for those of you that remember, I said that you can only jump and crouch using the eight character methods if set simulate physics is false. So when we get hit, we're going to set this to true so that we're in theory disabling that input option. The next thing that I think will be funny is we're going to get our capsule component again and we're gonna mess with gravity. So we are going to disable gravity so that our player feels that we've you know messed with them a little bit. So set enable gravity and we're gonna set our gravity to be false. So now when our player gets hit, they are going to lose gravity or they're gonna lose the ability to stay on the floor. The next thing that I think will be funny is if we kind of launch them into space. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna to need to create an impulse, but which way do we wanna throw them? If we go back into our viewport here and we look at this object, we would wanna send them from where they are out to the left and up. Well, to go left, we're gonna to need to move negative on the Y axis and to move up, we're going to need to move positive on the Z axis. For readability, I'm going to store this impulse in a vector. So let's create an F vector variable called impulse, and we're gonna make this equal to a new F vector. We don't want anything to happen in the X direction, so that can just be zero. And we really wanna hammer this away. So let's do negative 2,500 units in the y direction. Remember, we want negative because we want them to go left. And then we want them to go a positive big amount in this direction, let's say 1300 units, upwards in the z direction. So this is going to be the impulse that we're going to impart on our player. It's not going to actually throw them that amount, it's the amount of force we're giving to them. So now we're going to get our capsule component again, and we're going to call a method off of this called add impulse. And this is asking for three things. First, what impulse are we giving? where are we giving it to, and should the velocity change? So what impulse are we giving? We're giving it the impulse variable that we've created. I don't have a specific bone that I want to be pushed, so I'm going to call and give the default value, which is name.none. And of course by dot, I mean underscore in this case. And finally, we need to know if the velocity needs to change, and I don't really want it to. I haven't really found a reason to put that to true, so I'm just gonna leave it as false, because that's the default value. So now, when our character gets hit by an enemy, we are going to turn on physics so that we can't jump or crouch. We're going to disable gravity so that we float. And then the moment we disable gravity, we're gonna give them a big push through this add impulse method to make them fly into space. So let's save everything that we've worked on here and compile these changes. With success, we have now completed the C++ part of this, and now we need to do the blueprints to match. Unreal gives you a lot of control on what can collide and overlap with what. 
So let's go and make sure this is set up for our player, our enemy, and our world, respectively. Let's start with the player. So inside of our player, we are going to have a lot of things that are able to have collision. Both the capsule component and the mesh exist in the world and thus have collision on them. Starting with our capsule component here, let's search for collision. Now that's gonna bring up all the collision setting. We do not want physics simulation to generate hit events, so that's going to stay off. What I'm going to draw your attention to is this collision preset. This collision preset is what's going to dictate what interacts with what and in what way. So if I expand this, we can see that the default pawn is going to ignore stuff set to visibility, but block pretty much everything else. So anything with a tag of any of these objects is going to be blocked by this pawn. That is fine because we want things to obey our character. Inside of our mesh, we don't want things to interact with our mesh. So still looking for collision, we can see that our collision preset for our mesh is set to character mesh. And we can see that the character mesh preset is a lot more uh, picky with what it actually wants to block and interact with. Now, something that I'm going to get in the habit of doing is I'm going to change character mesh into no collision because I don't want my mesh to accidentally trigger anything that exists on my capsule component. And that's just a habit that I've gotten into that I'm not sure if it's a good or a bad habit. So let's compile and save our character and move on to our enemy now. So now we're gonna do the same process, but we're gonna do things a little bit differently. Inside of the box component for our enemy, let's search for our collision presets. First simulation generates hit events. We are not an actual physical object moving through space, so this is okay to stay disabled. But we do want this to generate overlapping events. So let's make sure this is checked off because this, this is the whole point. We set up overlap because this is what we want to happen. And now we're gonna change our collision preset to custom and we're going to set up something fun. We want this to be set to collision enabled so that we can have things happen. And now we get to set that object type. I want this to be a world dynamic object because this is an object that's going to be moving through the world. Now the only thing that I want our enemy to be able to interact with is stuff set to be pawn. Everything else I would like my enemy to move through or ignore. So we're gonna set everything else to be ignored. Now we're gonna look at our mesh and we can see here that we can turn off generate overlap events because we do not want our mesh to fire these overlap events. And then we can see that our collision preset is set to no collision, which is perfect. Let's compile and save that as well. So now the only other thing that we have to worry about is our floor here. So let's select our floor and go to the static mesh component for this as well. Now there is no specific collider, so we're going to treat the mesh of our floor as if it were the actual collider from our other objects, but we're gonna go and we're going to look for the collider for this. And we can see here that it's set to block all. So let's change this to be custom again, and we're still going to keep our collision enabled option. And now we're going to make this object type world static. And very similar to what we did with our enemy, we want our floor to block the pawn but to kind of ignore everything else. So everything that's not a pawn, we're going to set to ignore so that the pawn is going to walk while everything else does whatever it is it's meant to do. With all of that out of the way, we are going to delete both of these enemies and move into a test here. Let's make sure that our enemy is properly aligned with our platform here. Let's drag it over. That looks well enough aligned and let's just push it back over here so that we're not on the edge of our camera. So when we hit play now, we can see that they're passing through, but nothing's happening. What's going on? Well, when I exit out of this, there's a crucial mistake and something I didn't account for. Let's go over to this angle and you'll quickly see what is happening here. Based off of how we set up our spawners, they are not in line with our object at all. And in a 2D game, it can be a little bit uh, difficult to figure that out without specifically looking at this angle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all three of my spawners by shift clicking as I go through and then dragging them all so that they're in line with where they should actually go. So now when I hit play, we should expect that when an enemy moves through that they drift off into the sunset as we see here. And the more that they interact with this, the more of an impulse gets added because every time that they screw up, they get hit even harder. Now, in a future video, we will nix this so that it displays a score, but we're not at that point yet. So now let's actually move our player back so that we're not just on the edge of the seat here. And let's hit play. And now we're going to be able to actually play the game a little bit. We can duck to avoid that. We can jump 
And we might have to go and adjust the, how often our things are spawning because one second's a little fast, but I'll leave that up to you to do outside of this video. But you can see now that we have a collision system set up for use in our game, and it's kind of coming together. We have a little bit of a game going now. Now, in the next video, we're going to start our two-part journey into animation. And I'm going to give you some animations that we're going to copy for use in this project so that we can set up some animations for use two lectures from now. Good work, and I'll see you there. Have a great one.